Okay, um, I'd like to share our experiences with a more aggressive treatment scheme. Um, the background is that when we decided to offer our patients um, teaching PSMA therapy, we had some, some discussions with each other and with our colleagues from college urology, um, which treatment scheme we should use to treat these patients. Um, we've been well aware that some centers who started these treatments decided some treatment schemes based on the experience of treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, but we felt that we should not adapt this treatment scheme because we cannot compare the biology of neuroendocrine tumors, slow-growing tumor, with the more aggressive behavior of castration-resistant prostate cancer. And therefore, we thought about that a more aggressive treatment might, might be more appropriate. The second reason was that we felt that nephrotoxicity, which is considered as kind of those limiting in, in many radionuclide therapies, does not play such an important role as compared to neuroendocrine tumors given the limited life expectancy of patients suffering from this kind of disease. So we decided to treat the patient with three treatment cycles with 7.4 gigabecquerels each cycle every four weeks, and we performed, of course, a PSMA PET MRI for patient inclusion, blood counts, and we took a look at the blood count between every treatment cycle and did some restaging with the PET MRI 12 weeks off the start of treatment. We included 15 patients in this um, examination. Um, seven of these 15 patients were resistant to prior chemotherapy, um, most of the patients, except one, were castration resistant. Um, the one patient was a former neurologist and he refused to castration therapy. And this is also one of the 12 of the three patients who did not undergo all three cycles. It was the last patient uh, with minimal disease, a quite nice PSA response, and we decided to watch and wait instead of um, treating with the full three cycles. There were another two patients who were progressive already of the first cycle of therapy, and due to that reason, we did not continue with all three cycles. Why did we uh, PCMA PET MRI before? I want to stress the importance with um, this example. You can appreciate that this patient has some bone metastases, some lymph node metastases, and some extended liver metastases. And already on the overview, you can appreciate that there is some heterogeneity in the uptake. We have some metastases with a very intense uptake, and some metastases with a comparable faint uptake, and I think it's visible. Um, you have some metastases in the liver, if you go to the sectional image, with a very high uptake. You have some metastases with a low uptake, and you have even some metastases um, with a lack of uptake. This is one of our first patients, and we decided to treat him anyway um, because we didn't have the experience yet. And not surprisingly, these are the PSA responses of all treated patients. This was a patient with an increase in PSA, so this was a lesson we have learned um, that patients who did not show an uniform uptake uh, tend to not um, benefit from this kind of therapy. So we had three patients in all who did show an increase of PSA. Um, but we had um, eight patients with a PSA response of more than 50%. We felt that PSA response might not be the only site we should look on, but also on morphologic response. So we did a resist analysis, um, and we had partial response in 42% of all patients, stable disease in one third of patients, and still one quarter of patients who show progressive disease despite treatment. I want to share uh, three typical um, examples with you. This is a patient um, who showed a marked response. You can appreciate that many metastases disappeared. And if you take a look at the morphology, you can see that these medicinal lymph nodes showed a marked decrease in size. So this is a typical patient for a partial response due to therapy. We had some other examples. This is a patient who responded also, despite the drop of PSA did not reach 50%. And you get the impression that many of 
the metastases in the spine and in the rib did respond to therapy. There is a decrease in uptake, but you can also appreciate there developed some new metastases, like this two, um, which corresponded to lymph nodes who developed under therapy, and that might be the reason that the drop of the PSA was not um, more than 50 percent. And a third example of a patient with a very good response, um, the PSA dropped from 80 nanogram per milliliter to 23 nanogram per milliliter. And on the imaging, you see only um, small residual disease. Regarding toxicity, we had a quite favorable toxicity profile. We had one patient who showed an increase in toxicity regarding hemoglobin two patients with, an inc with a grade one um, toxicity regarding platelets, and four patients um, with leukocytopenia grade one. And in this 15 patients, we did not experience any grade two toxicity. We have treated now more patients, um, and to be honest, we experienced some hematotoxicity grade two, especially in patients with severe metastases of the bone marrow, um, so there might be some toxicity. And last but not least, we did not experience any toxicity regarding the kidney. I want to give you an outlook what lessons we have learned from the initial 15 patients and what way we moved further on. And as you can appreciate here, we have treated more patients now. We have taken care a little bit more on patient selection and have excluded all patients um, with metastases which showed only a faint uptake and we're able to increase the portion of patients with a PSA response of more than 50%. And of course, we had some nice examples, like in this patient, these are the PSA values over time. And you can see that at the time point where we initiated lutetium PSMA treatment, we had a markedly drop of PSA, and the PSA stayed low over some time. But this is not the typical patient. In contrast, we experienced more often situations like this where the PSA dropped nicely after initiation of lutetium PSMA, but after a short time, we appreciated a, a steady increase of PSA after a short time. And at that time, we decided to retreat this patient and again experienced a drop of PSA. And based on these experiences, we now have changed our scheme we treat the patient again with three cycles of 7.4 gigabecquerels, do a restaging based on PET-MRI, and if there is no contraindication, all metastases still show an uptake, blood counts are okay, we move on and treat the patients with, again, three cycles of 7.4 gigabecquerel of lutetium PSMA. I cannot share the results yet, um, but I hope I can present it in one year at the next Theranostics Congress. So what did we conclude? We felt that aggressive treatment scheme is feasible and appears to be safe. We feel that we have comparable high response rates as well as regarding PSMA, uh, PSA levels, as well as regarding morphologic response. Um, and we feel that as we experienced quite early relapse uh, in patients, even in patients who responded to the treatment, um, that it might be appropriate to continue treatment despite of waiting to a progress and then retreat the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a question from Harvey Turner who's heading to the microphone. Uh, whilst he gets there, can I ask, was this done as part of a, was this a prospective trial? Or was this done as a compassionate access uh, with sort of retrospective analysis? No, it was. All treatments are based on compassionate use and it's retrospective analysis. We heard an inspiring lecture yesterday from a regulator who was proposing solutions rather than problems for a change. And he said that he couldn't think of the future of clinical trials in cancer as monotherapy. We don't do monotherapy anymore. You have provided dose intensification, but an oncologist would be critical of your trial design because they look at nuclear physicians as not being aggressive enough. 
you have grade two toxicity. That's not toxicity. Until you get grade four toxicity in at least three patients, you haven't done an oncological clinical trial. So what I wanted to ask you is, are you contemplating combining your radiopeptide therapy with chemotherapy, for instance, alternating docetaxel uh, concomitant cycles with the lutetium, or any other therapy, because ideally, you need at least two arms and perhaps three if you're going to characterize it as an aggressive approach to an aggressive disease, with which the oncologists would agree, but I think that they would, as they have before, criticize nuclear physicians for being too timid in our approach. I agree with your opinion. Um, I also think that our focus on in this kind of disease, we should not allow our focus on, on avoiding side effects, because that's not important in these patients. But regarding combination therapy, we have to, we have to discuss what is more important in this patient to induce a very high proportion of response rate or to delay the time point of progression. Um, I'm not sure which, which of these two approaches might be better. Um, because with the combination therapy, it's more likely that you have to stop treatment at one time point due to toxicity. And as, as we know, these patients tend to progress quite early. So maybe, I don't know yet, but maybe it's the better way to just continue treatment as long as it's possible. Another question? Sorry? Quality of life. Well, quality of life is comparably good in, in due to this treatment. I, I did not show you the data, but um, of course we asked a patient about xerostomia, which is, well, hampering quality of life when it occurs. And we had not one patient who suffers from severe xerostomia, which impairs its quality of life. Not yet. Maybe they will develop it. Not yet. Most others in this field has used the dose of 6.0. Mm -hmm. You use 7.4 for each dose. Uh, and uh, what, what is the reason for those choices? Why do you think that the profession in your studies onwards would be more courses of 7.4 instead of more courses mm -hmm. with more than 7.4? Um, the simple reason for, for 7.4 compared to 6.1 was where the results of dosimetry. I think there's no reason to work with only 6.0 gigabecquerels because the, the dose to the kidney and the hematotoxicity is quite low. So why not increase the dose? Yes, but why then stop with 7.4? I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, we, we, we are, I think we are, we are, we are still at the, at the level of trial and error at some kind. Yes, but trial and error would also be to say, well, if you can expand with more causes, you could also expand with higher doses of the same drug. You mm -hmm. don't have to put in chemotherapy before mm -hmm. you know what you can do, uh, and you, certainly you could do more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.